<laughs> you are now live again. Hello, Insta. I'm Great. trying this Thank again. You. Hopefully, you're seeing me. Hopefully, you can post your questions. Yes. Thank you for being first in there saying hello. Thank you, Mark from Asheville. Hello, Walter. Good to see you. Okay, back to you, Taylor. All right, cool. So today is going to be about possibilities. So let's start with a the riff there, and then we'll take questions. Okay, so first, just to reiterate, there's a tragedy unfolding all around us. Peace of mind is hard to find. Many people are uh, at a in a jam because of health. Certainly the economy is frozen. All of those things are things we could repeat over and over and over again. It won't make any of them better. We are sheltering in place. We are flattening the curve. We are doing our best. But what we really need right now is the peace of mind to find possibility, to find hope, and to go forward. Because it turns out that's going to come from the grassroots. It's going to come from each of us. It is not going to come from some magical mountaintop. If you can find five people or 10 people, connect them, lead them, empower them, that will multiply. That is the ripple that was, is within everybody's grasp. If you are holding a phone right now, if you have a keyboard in front of you right now, you have the means of production. You have the ability to lead. Now, you could spend all of that time reminding people that the world is about to end, that we are facing an apocalypse, that an asteroid is going to plow into the planet. What good is that? It is not helpful. We do not need more breaking news. The news is already broken. What we need is, as my friends Ben and Roz would say, the art of possibility, meaning that you can weave together small little threads of opportunity, of possibility, and of learning. And if you can figure out how to learn something and then pass it on, it will make things better. People do not need you to sacrifice yourself for their anxiety. They need to be seen, to be heard, to be treated with dignity and respect. And we can do that for three people, just three. And if you do it for three people, it starts to begin to spread. If you can do it for six, that's amazing. When Taylor and I are able to sit here and talk to, how many people saw us last time? 40,000, something like that? Something like that, yeah. The ripples continue to spread. So I hate to say it, but it's on you. It's on me. It's on each of us to imagine what could be better, just a little better. Don't worry about Wolf Blitzer. Don't worry about cable news. Don't worry about Twitter. Worry about the circle of people that you can help, that you can teach, that you can be there for because that's the opportunity of our moment. And I hope you don't waste it. Yeah, that's, that's really important. So we have a question from Kay, Kay Senya uh, from Instagram. And I think this question is uh, very direct to what you just talked about. So she said, how can, we give, how can we give without hurting yourself in the process? Right, so I did a blog post a couple weeks ago that said, um, there's a difference between being generous and being free. You don't help the people in town by giving away every item in the supermarket because then the supermarket is going to disappear. And what medical professionals understand is it doesn't pay to help one patient if you're going to die doing so. You put on your own safety gear first. And that thing on the airplane where they say, put your oxygen mask on before helping others, there's a reason for that. Because you can help a lot of people if you're wearing an oxygen mask. And so what I am saying here is not to be selfish, but I'm also saying we don't need you to be a martyr. What we need to do instead is figure out what is it that you have to contribute that doesn't go away once you contribute it. And what that is, is passion and compassion and education and learning and insight and possibility. Because the more you give that to people, the more you have. All right, so we should tell them about our new program. So Please. We launched a new program today. It's called the Emerging Leaders Program. It is for undergraduate college students who are navigating this world right now of uncertainty and are really looking to level up. So um, it's a five-day program this summer in June. It's full scholarship, uh, free of charge, and it's application only. So if you want to go learn about it, on the 
handy new thing we got going on on Facebook and LinkedIn, I can go ahead and show you the link. There we go. Um, so you can vi uh, visit akimbo.com slash emerging leaders. So on Instagram. If you're on Insta, go to Seth's top blog and it's the top post of the day. Uh, here's the deal. Most of the people on this call aren't in the target group, but you know someone who is. This post and uh, Taylor's announcement has already been seen by 50,000, 200,000 people. If each of you share it with five people who need to see it, we're going to try to spread it. What is going on here is a live, intensive, it's going to take many, many, many hours over five days. Our goal is to change the way the people who show up for it act, fundamentally think and act in the world. It is not about education. It is about learning. It's going to be quite a boot camp. And Taylor is the powerhouse behind and it. And what? <laughs> All online. All online, yes. You don't have to go anywhere and it doesn't cost anything. Thank you, Taylor, for spearheading this and for making it happen magically. Yes, I'm so excited about this. Uh, as a recent grad myself last year, I know how important something like this can be for someone going through uh, the college experience right now. So excited to bring it to the world. And um, if you have questions about it, feel free to drop those below as well. We'll take some of them. All right. We'll kick it off with a question. Let's see, this is from Derek. Um, he said, what advice would you give to college students who are losing their internships and jobs right now, uh, this coming summer, due to everything going Phew. Um, here's the deal. College, for most people who go, is an artifact of the industrial system. It is high school, but with more binge drinking. It is a way to demonstrate that you have access to an elite institution so that you can send a message to employers going forward that you are the kind of high functioning compliant leader or leader in training that they can keep happening. Uh, I put on do not disturb but do not chat thread that I am on and so you're all good. All right so what happens is some people go to college and get something out of it that's really powerful, which is showing up in the world to make something happen. That is what college is supposed to be for. That is its history. But too many people went to college because they liked the football team. They liked the social thing. They went into significant amounts of debt, did what they were told, got good grades, used the clicker in class. And now they're like, what? Where is my job? Because we needed that in 1965 and 1985, but we don't. What we can do is use this moment if you're in college interrupted and say, wait a minute, right now, I can lead something. I can build something. I can invent something. I can start something right now because the risk is super low because you're not expected to be doing anything anyway. And I'm talking from experience. What happened to me uh, in 1980, 79, 80, is they ran a little ad in the college paper because two people had started a little college business uh, on my school. We had 4,400 students and they had failed a month into it. It just wasn't working. So I applied to take it over. And so did this guy I'd never met, Steve Dennis, whose new book is out this week, also applied. And for whatever reason, they hired both of us without introducing us to each other. They handed us the keys and they left. And Steve and I built the largest student-run business in America. We had 440 employees out of 4,400 people in the whole campus. We got paid 50 bucks a week. We couldn't make more. We couldn't make less. We just did it. We had a birthday cake service, a travel agency, a temporary employment agency, a snack bar, a concert service. Every week we started something new. And that was the key to my professional development in college. Other than meeting my wife in college, those are the two best things that happened when I was there. And what I've said to people who are now in this moment, that's your opportunity. Use this safe window you've got right now to leap forward. And so that internship you're not going to have, good riddance. Because you don't need practice filing. And you don't need practice sitting in an office not doing very much. You need to be part of a studio. And if you can't find one, start one. That's my rant. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, there's so many students at home right now who are thinking, God, what could I create? And there's so much that they can create. I mean, you think about podcasting right now, that's huge. Figure out something that you're interested in talking about and then share that voice with the world in the way that you can. Um, or starting a blog, writing daily. 
All right, cool. We got a lot going on. There are so many channels that are seeing this right now. So I'm, I'm sifting through things, but here's a question. Um, so this is a question from Molly. She said, how important do you think it is to get educated later in life? I think it's really important to get learning later in life. And that's what we do at Akimbo. The Alt MBA has transformed the lives of uh, 4,500 adults in 74 countries. That if you stop learning, you might as well give up now. Learning, that's all we got. Learning is how do I shift my posture, take advantage of possibility, make things better by making better things. If you don't have that going on and the world is shifting, you're gonna keep falling behind. Education, on the other hand, if there's a particular piece of paper that will open the door for you, right? If you need an aesthetician's license to go be an aesthetician, that's probably a reasonable investment for you. But for the rest of us, education's overrated and learning is ignored too often. Yeah, so we have a question um, that I think feeds off of this idea of possibility and the possibility of getting better clients and customers. So Two Brothers Studios says, how can you stay consistent for your current customers while changing the culture to reach better customers? Right. And this is something we're covering the Freelancers Workshop, which starts this week at thefreelancersworkshop.com. Uh, what's a brand? A brand is a promise. It's a promise we make in which we say, if you need this, I will do this for you. And so if the promise you're used to making is you can pick anyone and I'm anyone, and I will meet spec and I am cheaper than everybody else. Who do you think you're going to get as clients? You're going to get people who want the cheapest person. If you want to shift your brand, you have to shift the promise you make. Now, the beauty of it, if you're running a small entity, is that most people have never heard of you. So you can show up to the new people with a new promise. And that promise has to be one that you earn. And that promise is, I can do this very specific thing for this very specific group of people better than anyone else. And that's why it costs more. And that's a race to the top. And that is the shift that we have been talking about at Akimbo for five years, is what would it mean if you race to the top instead of the bottom? All right, cool. We have a few questions coming in about people asking, hey, this is the year I am in college. Can I apply for this program? Yes, if you were an undergraduate in college, this was designed for you. So we're excited to um, get your applications. Again, I will put up the link. Um, but this question is from Rich, and I'm going to show it on our handy new... Ooh, uh, ooh, ooh, it worked! Ooh, it worked. Okay, cool. So Rich says, hi, guys. Thanks for putting this on. What would you say to encourage K-8 teachers uh, who are now teaching from home, watching their kids, who are not feeling comfortable teaching over teleconferencing software? Well, first of all, Rich, thank you. Thank you not just for inaugurating this new system, uh, but thank you for being a teacher. Teachers who care who fight the bureaucracy, who stand up for their kids. They're the backbone of our culture. I believe in public school, I believe in teachers. But I don't believe in lectures. And I think that online learning is a huge opportunity to create peer-to-peer -peer opportunities. Because when you lecture to 25 fractious kids, you need all 25 of them to pay attention at once or the whole thing falls apart. On the other hand, when you create projects for kids to do together, suddenly this Metcalf's Law parallel process, what is it, 25 times 24, it's a huge number of connections are possible. What that means is that you don't have to be on call every single minute because they are teaching the others. Check out the Acton Academy online. I have not affiliated with them, but if you look at ACTON Acton Academy, they run a school with kids of every age, from six to 15 or 18, and only two adults in the whole building, counting the custodial staff. It is possible. It is possible to create huge learning opportunities without demanding that people sit and watch a video. All right, so we have a question from David on Instagram that I really love. He said, hey Seth, to be honest, I'm so afraid to ship, and I'm so afraid that people will laugh at me or make fun of me or I'll fail. Any tips for how to overcome this? Sorry, I was 